Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today we're going to talk about making a cool fallen temple desert base. I don't know. It's just a cool looking base and I thought it'd be fun to show how I kind of make display bases when I want them to be simple uh, but but really tell a story. So let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vincey V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vincey V style. I'm painting up this super cool barbarian figure. You saw him in a recent video and I wanted to take the chance to actually make a display base for him. Now this guy's not really going to competition or anything. He was just really uh, more of a chance to show with all of you how to do these like really intense saturated tan skin tones and add that color. But I still want a base that tells a story. And so today what I thought we would make is this guy looks like a cool raider. He's got that deep tan so I wanted to put him out in the sun in the desert uh, in sort of a wasteland. So we're going to make a base that tells a, a small but simple story uh, about fallen temples and, and him sort of standing atop these ruins. And we're going to do that in about two inches by two inches. So let's head over to the desk. Let's start building something fun. All right, well, if we're going to make a base, we got to start with materials. This is a simple little wooden block. It's a two by two inch block. I think they're made for like kids toys. You can buy them from craft stores and off Amazon and eBay and stuff like that in bulk, cheap. That is some resin pillars and columns. We've got some indoor house plant tree bark. Uh, this looks like rocks and is great. That's what it looks like. You can get it at your hardware store, or your garden center, or anything like that. Uh, these are some little pillars and fallen statues, basing bits from Gamer's Grass. Uh, thank you, Gamer's Grass, for sending those along. And then these are some glass chunks, I guess, um, from again the uh, from my local. You can get those at like fairy garden centers and craft stores and garden centers and things like that. Yet again, um, I got that from my uh, Amish store. Uh, from a fairy garden center. So we're going to start out here just kind of laying down a base and we're going to, you know, lay a lot over, over this, but these are just going to be kind of the, the little things that get our figure up and elevated. And as I'm working with the, the, one of the reasons I'm using this glue as opposed to anything else is because I want a chance for it. It won't dry right away. It actually, the wood very much soaks some of this up. And so you'll, you'll have a few minutes to, to, well, minutes is probably long, but you have a few little bit of time to, to sort of work with this and you'll see is how I kind of slide things around and find exactly the right angle even though I kind of set this up beforehand before I started shooting I still make these minor adjustments and that's the first thing I want to tell you when you're making a base like this especially when you have sort of stacked elements do make sure your figure sits on here and fits on here and is correct and all of that beforehand like test out your vision before you put the figure on and you know kind of dry fit as it were all of the components same as you would for any normal miniature um, once you've got kind of everything in place i just scatter some other drops of glue around and uh, we're good to go that's the center point now we need those other details that bring the base to life and start to tell the story so here i'm using this stone helmet it looks like the sort of the head of statuary that's been crumbled you can see like the cracks and stuff in it up close um, I'm also going to put a little bit of a fallen pillar here on the back of the thing. One of the things that's fun is you can have pillars of different sizes and scales and you can use them all in the same piece because pillars are actually lots of different sizes, it turns out. Now, if we're going to have this destroyed temple, we've got to have more than just one fallen pillar. These things would be smashed apart and there would be lots of rubble and rocks everywhere. So my next steps are to basically create all the other size rubble. So I'm going down from sort of the original bark, which would represent these big chunks of stone, down to these um, glass chunks, which are going to be like the, the smaller uh, rocks and pieces. And then we'll get down all the way to the, uh, we'll get down all the way to the, the sort of smallest elements, as it were, which is right here which is just some very small scatter stone. But it's important when you're making a base, especially one that that's gonna, you, know, you want to feel like a credible environment, that it has all of these different sizes and textures of elements in them. If you're gonna have broken rocks, you know, rocks when they get smashed and some building falls apart, it's not like all one size uniform rock. So you wanna make sure you're running a full gamut from these big giant rocks, the big pillar itself, down to the medium, down to the very small. And then as you'll see, we're gonna use texture paste to then simulate the, uh, the, the desert itself, right? Kind of the smallest stuff. 
So here I'm using some Vallejo ground texture and what I'm gonna do is a couple of things. First, I'm going to just cover all of the rest of the wood uh, that's around. So that'll be number one. The other thing I do is I use it to hide some of the nonsense in the 3D printing, like there on the edge where there's uh, clearly those sort of resin print lines or whatever that from where this thing was cast. Uh, we can cover that kind of stuff up because dirt and dust and detritus would be everywhere up on this. If these things have truly fallen apart, it's all mixed in. The dirt and the rocks and the statuary and everything is going to be all up in each other's business. So I'm pretty liberal with this quote unquote dust and dirt across the miniature, bringing it up onto the rocks, onto the other elements to fully integrate the scene. Remember, the story you tell is really in two parts. So the first is the pieces and the, the choices that you make in what elements you use in the base. So like here using the pillars, using the fallen statuary, the rocks, that kind of stuff. That's all part of the story I'm telling. The other part's going to be in the paint. And you want to make sure that when you have lighting in a figure or narrative in a figure, you know, if you're using an environmental color, if you're telling a story, if you're having a directional that the light, that the light is coming from, all of that needs to carry over into the base as well to sell it. This is a common thing I see people go wrong on. They'll do some kind of directional light or OSL or something or whatever on, a, on the figure, and then they'll make the base and it'll just be completely flat and normal as though nothing is different. The figure has to exist in the world that you have created and told through the way that you painted it and the lighting you created. So let's start painting and see how that gets on. So let's do some painting. Uh, I'm just gonna start out by actually laying down, this is some warm brown um, from Pro Acryl. And the reason I'm starting brown, even though this will end up being a desert, is because this is sort of the lowest base tone, the shadow tone for it. And so I want this to just kind of be everywhere to set the, the darkest tone and cover everything else up. Now, red, gray, bone, and pastel yellow. So two from Pro Acryl Signature Series and one uh, AK paint. This is going to be my base for my stone. And we're gonna work with this stone a lot. I wanted something that was more naturalistic, that was very warm. The figure that goes on top of this is very, very warm. He's in the desert, he has a very warm skin tone, it's very tan. So I wanna carry that through to everything in here. I didn't want, like, again, this is the thing I tell people all the time, please stop with just the regular gray stone. Gray stone is boring. It's the death of visual interest in your piece. Stone is so exciting. It can be so many amazing colors and have so many different tones in it. So let's mix it up and use some different fun stuff. Here I'm like leaning into this yellow and pink to really push that kind of like warm sandstone, you know, feel to the thing. I start out with just some fast wet blending. None of this is going to be final, but I'm trying to set those values. I'm trying to focus the light over on the right side from, from the viewer perspective. And you'll see me doing that here as well. So I am gonna dry brush some of that ice yellow, but when I do so, I'm dry brushing it always directionally from the, I guess the, the figures left to the right or from the viewer from as we're watching it from the right to the left. I'm going one direction with the dry brush only. And that is so all the light is only hitting that side where the light's coming from. You can see how much I've pushed the light to our viewer side, right side of the base. Uh, now I'm just gonna hit everything with some Agrax. This is gonna darken everything way down, but it's really important to get all those shadows in there to create that depth. Uh, in the end, we're gonna cover a lot of this up, but this is really about just sort of adding that depth in between all of the different layers, creating some natural shadows here in the base, uh, picking out some of those natural textures and stuff like that. This is far from the last step, but just a nice, quick, important step that that you know helps to really set all these textures apart and lets me see what I'm working with for the later steps. All right, so now that it's dry, we've brought our, our base way down. It's looking very dirty. We don't want it quite that dirty. So important thing I'm doing here, I'm not just painting the upper ridges. This is another thing I see people do wrong a lot. The notice how in the in between, right, the little recessed areas, I still painted light. Those are upward facing areas, so they would still be lit. So once I kind of just go over a layer of everything on all the those areas, we get over to pigment. 
So using this pigment, now finally we're going to start setting some desert. So here using this sienna color, um, we're going to go ahead and really work some of this yellow in. People often ask me, do I fix my pigment? No, um, but I will totally varnish the figure at the end, so that'll help to lock it in. But what you'll see me do here is after I get some big dollops of this pigment on, I wipe the brush and then I just really use this, this synthetic you know, junk brush to work that pigment in. And I actually end up going over the whole figure like twice with this yellow pigment, or over the whole base, I'm sorry. Um, just really getting that yellow in there and then working it, working it, working it down in the paint. And notice I'm also bringing it up onto the stone elements. Now with the pillars and the stone, we want to use a contrasting color. So here I'm using this violet to set the sort of deepest shadows, but add this like really rich hue. When you first put this on, it's going to be really intense, but just like I did with the yellow, I work a bunch of this off. I just push it and push it and push it and slap it around with that dry brush, work a lot of it off because I just wanted to, as you can see there, set the tone. Once that's in place, I then use the clay brown or the clay color, this much lighter pink, to start again re-instantiating some of that. This also helps hide some of the sins from the previous wash. I'm effectively using the dry pigment to blend my previous steps. Uh, now, because I want to sell the idea that the light is coming from the figure's left side, our right, I need to also create shadows. Remember, you can't create light without creating shadow. So I grab some dark black and dark brown pigment and opposing the bright yellow I have on the figure's left side of the base, I work those shadows into all those recessed deep areas, just shoving that dark pigment in there. And again, I can work it loose and smooth it out. It is a really easy way to do those natural shadows. Now I want to bring up the lights, really show that reflection. So working with a very thin glaze of the pastel yellow, I'm hitting the only the areas that are the most highlighted, the most toward the left side, again, our right, really annoying to keep saying that, uh, of the actual pillar. I'm also doing things like edge highlighting the little ridges on the pillar, but I'm doing so with this very thin paint. And as a matter of fact, there where I went a little too thick, I'll go in, thin it down, and then just kind of work that wet paint around and smooth it out. But yet again, even with these glazes, I will do some down in the recesses as well on the very tip top of the pillar because it's the most raised thing. And as you can see there, now we have this really nice natural progression between the pigment and the paint where we really have the perception that the light is cast from that left side. Uh, if this is, I didn't want this to be a completely sandy desert. I wanted a little bit of, of uh, tufts and stuff in there. So we're going to use these awesome pig, uh, these awesome tufts from Gamer's Grass. They're sort of this dark red and dark brown. I really like them for deserts, um, especially once we paint them here in a moment. But I'm just going to kind of scatter them around. Now with tufts, they often look very fake if you just kind of put two or three on there. The key is placement. They need to be in a logical place. So I don't just scatter them haphazardly. They're like in recesses in between rocks. They're effectively in places where water would naturally gather. And that liquid, that condensation that would gather from the shadows, from the rock, from the stone, and then run and, and create these rivulets, that's where the life would grow and where we'd see these little plants. The other way to stop the fake tuft syndrome is to paint them. And we start by, of course, shoving some wash down into all of these things uh, as so I'm working it around and then shoving it down into the tuft. It will look really weird when you first start, but once it dries, it, because you shoved it all around the edge and down into the heart of the thing, it will integrate it nicely. Final step is we're going to use pastel yellow and the bone to dry brush the tufts. The pastel yellow is for the tufts on the left side. The bone is for the tufts on the right side. And we just give a very light dry brush to make it look like the light passing through the thin upper reaches of the grass. You can wet your brush and work it off as you see me doing here if it gets a little too intense, but I'm still respecting the light. The stuff over here on the on this side of it gets the pastel yellow. All the tufts on the left side get the bone to completely and finally sell that illusion of light. There you go. He's all done. Uh, I'm really excited about this guy. He was a lot of fun. 
uh, to paint up, and this base was a lot of fun to make. Uh, so now he can go join his other friends in my cabinet. Uh, this guy was, was, was really great. I hope that you found something that you uh, can use in your own basing for your own figures here, whether they be for your army, your display figures, or even for competition. If you've got any questions I didn't answer, hey, drop those down in the comments below. I always answer every question that gets asked. Uh, if you liked this, give it a like. If you feel I've earned your subscription, hey, hit subscribe. It's really appreciated. If you want to take the next step and support the channel, you can do so through the Patreon link down below. Uh, that at Patreon is focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.